the reflection on equanimity focuses on karma. All beings are the owners of their actions, heir of their actions, born of their actions, related through their actions. We have actions as our arbitrator. In other words, it's the actions that we've done and we're doing. Those are the things that lead to happiness, lead to sorrow, lead to ease, lead to, dif lead to difficulty. Why should that give rise to equanimity? Because it's useful to reflect on that when you realize there are things that you would like to have a certain way and they're not going to be that certain way. Times when you'd like to help someone else, times when you'd like to help yourself, and yet it's not working. At least it's not yet working. And the equanimity there is useful several ways. One, if it's something where you really can't make a difference, you have to just put it aside. But then you can also ask yourself, well, if it's the fact that I'm not yet making a difference, maybe I could act in a different way and make a difference. So it points you back to your own actions. This is where appropriate attention comes in, the element of discernment in equanimity. You take stock of your actions, what you have been doing, what you are doing, and see what could be changed. Is that recollection, the fact that all living beings are the owners of their actions, etc., that's also a reflection for giving rise to heedfulness, giving rise to sangwega. Heedfulness in the sense that your actions are going to make a difference, so you have to be careful what you do, what you say, what you think, and particularly what your intentions are. Because your intentions make all the difference. And as for Sangwega, when you start thinking about the fact that everybody, no matter where you go, is subject to the principles of action, no matter what you could be reborn as, even in the high levels of the devas, they are subject to their actions as well. And you would think that living up in the higher levels, they'd have less pain weighing down their minds and they would have the opportunity to do a lot more good. Well, they have other problems. There was a Brahmin. There was a Brahma that the Buddha had to go and, as I say, and tie torment because he thought he'd achieve the ultimate achievement. There's nothing better than what he had. And so the Buddha had to go and show him, okay, there's there is something better, because that pride was what st stood in his way. Then, of course, there are the sensual devas, and they're just having such a good time they couldn't worry about what the consequences of their actions are, because they're enjoying what they're doing so much right there. They don't see any trouble. It's because it's hidden. So equanimity is not just a passive state of mind. It's learning what you have to put down so that you can look at what's really important. And what you put down are your, your likes and your dislikes about things, wanting them to be this way and just pushing and pushing and pushing to get them that way. And if it's not working, you've got to stop and ask. Are you pushing against a wall? Are you pushing against a, a locked door? Or What's the problem? If it's a locked door, find the key. If you're pushing against a wall, stop pushing. Push someplace else. Equanimity has to use discernment. So right here while you're meditating, how are the results? Been meditating for about five minutes now. Something should be showing now. If the results aren't what you want, what could you change? Of course, this has to be balanced out with the realization that sometimes the results will take a while. So if you change things around, it does seem to be an improvement, well, do what you think is best and stick with it for a long while. But try to be as objective as possible in evaluating how it's going. If 
that there are pains in the body that you can't change, well, those are things you may have to accept. Or again, you can change your approach to them. Sometimes going into a, a very solid or recalcitrant part of the body just makes it work, worse. And so you've got to stop, step back a bit and just hover around the edges, see what you can relax, see how gentle you can be with it, see if that works. So if the direct approach doesn't work, you try an indirect approach. There are times when you have to focus really heavily and other times when you have to be very gentle. So remember, you have a range of actions. And if the action you're doing right now is not getting the results you want, step back a bit. See if there's something you can change. If you've tried your full repertoire, then you just have to leave it alone. This is where the the root of the Pali word for equanimity comes in. It means to look on. Otherwise, you just look. And sometimes just looking means, okay, you know it's there, but you've got to put your primary attention someplace else to see if there's something else you can actually improve. And other times it means keeping your focus there, but just watching it for a while and being willing to wait for a while to see what the results are going to be. This is where equanimity ties in with patience. You start noticing certain changes, and you ask yourself, like, why did those changes happen? Or you look away for a while and look back again, because sometimes the way you look is part of the problem. So if you look away and then catch what happens, what happens when, as soon as you look, what's going on there? Sometimes you find that if your mind is wandering away, your, your breath is perfectly fine, but as soon as you focus on the breath, something gets wrong. Okay, what are you doing when you focus on the breath? Try to catch it as soon as you can. So we're not just here passively accepting whatever comes up. You have to remember the Buddha's picture of the mind is that it's active simply that in its action sometimes it's doing something unskillful. So you have to learn how to back off for a bit and watch for the sake of learning what to do better. And as long as you can't figure out what to do better, just keep on watching. Something will have to show after a while. So some of the reasons why we find equanimity difficult is one, we're got certain desires that we can't let go of. The other is that we're afraid that by being equanimous we're going to be too passive or too cold-hearted. And that's what, not what the Buddha is teaching. After all, he does teach equanimity as part of the Brahma-viharas. And when equanimity is a reflection on action, it's not telling you to be passive, it's just telling you Look carefully at things in terms of the principle of action, what you've done in the past, what you're doing right now, what the results of what you've done in the past, which results are showing right now, and which results of what you're doing right now are showing, too. So it keeps coming back to your intentions. What are your intentions? Sometimes the intentions are good, but the strategies you're using are not good. Sometimes the intentions are not good at all. And then no matter what strategies you're going to use, nothing's really going to work. When the Buddha analyzes actions for the sake of assigning offenses, there's the issue of intention, there's the issue of perception the object, the effort, and the result. And sometimes it's useful to look at your mistakes in meditation. There may not be offenses, but okay, what, what is your intention? Intention sometimes includes impulse. In other words, is there greed, anger, and delusion involved? Or your motivation, why are you doing this? 
your intention? What do you want, want to get out of this? Maybe something can be changed there. Or your perception. How are you perceiving things right now? What's the story you put around things? What are the images you have in your mind? What happens if you change those images? The image of where you think you are in your body, your image of what the breath is doing. What happens if you change that? Object, breath. Sometimes the mind doesn't want to stay with the breath, or it starts getting sleepy when it stays with the breath. Well, you might want to change. Start contemplating the different parts of the body. Visualize them to go through the whole catalog. Give the mind work to do so it doesn't just drift off and come back and wonder where it was. Effort. What is the effort you're doing right now? How are you focusing? Where are you focusing? How much pressure are you putting on the focus? Is it too much or too little? And you read these things by reading the results. So the teachings on equanimity are there to teach you about action, to take a mature attitude towards your actions, seeing where you've made a mistake, where things are not going well, and what you can do to change. That's one of the definitions of maturity, is admitting a mistake. Because if you don't admit them, you're never going to learn from them because you can't even see them. And it closes off all possibility of improvement. So that's something we have to be equanimous about as well. Okay? The fact that we have made mistakes, we've done unskillful actions. But we have the opportunity right now to do something more skillful. We can learn. So equanimity is not just acceptance and it's not just passivity. It's directly related to appropriate attention. If there's something wrong, look at your intentions. If there's something wrong, look at what you're doing. Your intentions may be good, but the, the means may be wrong, or your intention may be corrupted. And then in that case, no matter how good the means are, whatever strategies are, it's not going to work. So look at these aspects of your actions, the intentions, the perceptions that underlie them. Because remember that equanimity is not here just as a, as a resting spot or a final resting spot. It's actually one of the prerequisites for learning how to meditate. Remember the Buddha's instructions to Rahula. He told him, make your mind like earth. Good things are thrown on the earth and the earth doesn't react. Bad things are thrown on the earth the earth doesn't react. But that's not the last instruction of meditation. It's the very beginning of instruction of meditation. It's there so that you can see things clearly, so you can learn how to look at your actions impartially. Because after he teaches that principle of non-reactivity, then he teaches the steps of breath meditation. Those are proactive. The whole point being that if you're going to be doing the meditation, you want to train your mind to be a good observer, a fair observer. Because otherwise you'll never know what results you're really getting. Because your likes and dislikes are going to get in the way. You're wanting what you're doing right now to be the right thing may get in the way of seeing whether it really is the right thing or not. So always combine equanimity with appropriate attention. That's how you get the most use out of it.